Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast. For the first time in a while, since way back in November of 2023, we're fresh out of Beaver Stadium, and we've lost our voices from talking about this already uh, for several hours now. We've been sitting together in the press box. Now we're here together in the post-game podcast. Daniel Gowan, myself, uh, hopefully you've caught us on our post-game podcast format the last couple of Penn State seasons. This is the post-game, uh, as post-game as it gets for a spring practice, which was a scrimmage. Four quarters of football, Daniel. Everybody except the quarterback is fair game to knock to the turf. So a little bit different than what we've seen thus far from the 2024 Nittany Lions. Happy to get alongside you with this uh, on this evening, fresh out of Beaver Stadium, to break this down a little bit while it is still fresh in our minds. Definitely. It was good to be back in there. Wasn't exactly the the greatest weather day, uh, but we got to see some real football. We got to get some answers uh, for questions, and we got to kind of – have real data to form some off-season thoughts about. I know that everyone talks about how you can't draw the biggest conclusions from something like the blue-white game, but it's another data point, more information for us to kind of store, some stuff to keep in the back of our minds uh, as we move forward into the, to the I guess, the real off-season now. Daniel, we got a significant data point when it comes to the status of Keandre Lambert-Smith on Saturday in Beaver Stadium beforehand, during, after the game, uh, becoming more clear that Keandre Lambert-Smith no longer really part of the equation uh, here for the 2024 team. Uh, James Franklin was asked uh, about his absence, and I guess we should give a little bit of background here. Uh, we did not see Keandre Lambert-Smith at Tuesday's practice availability. Uh, we get a weekly look. We don't see a lot of guys, though. Injuries happen. But as the week goes on and conversations happen and it becomes more clear that there's more to it than, than just a, a one practice situation with Keandre Lambert-Smith, uh, ultimately uh, on, on Thursday evening, I believe it was, uh, Matt Zenitz uh, from 24-7 Sports, who does a lot of our national uh, transfer portal coverage, reported out uh, that Keandre Lambert-Smith uh, was likely to enter the transfer portal. That window opens on Monday. It's going to be insane across college football. We've talked about that on the podcast. So after kind of talking our way around that on our, our last episode of the podcast, we can kind of talk about it now, Daniel, because because James Franklin was asked directly by Mark Brennan uh, following the Blue White game uh, for his comments uh, on Keandre Lambert Smith and and what that status was, considering these reports and considering that we did not see Keandre Lambert Smith not just in practice but in or around Beaver Stadium or in action or in uniform or in street clothes whatsoever uh, on Saturday. And so James Franklin. Uh, Decided, you know, responded by saying he was open to discussing players who were on the field on Saturday, players who were in his locker room. Aside from that, he wasn't going to go any further. Uh, further on, uh, we heard from Drew Aller uh, on the subject. I could say you really didn't hear from Drew Aller on the subject. He was asked, have you talked to, to Keandre Lever smith this week? And he said that's a, that's a James Franklin kind of discussion, and he wasn't going to expand on that subject. So, Daniel, again, names can't officially go in the portal until Monday. And this is a situation where Keandre Lambert Smith needs to determine what's best for his final year of college eligibility. Uh, he's someone that that I personally have covered for five or six years. I feel like because of going back to his high school career, now in year five here on campus. Um, I'm fortunate to see it, it seemingly come to an end this way. It's something that we'll get into more detail, I think, on our Monday episode, and we'll also go a, a little bit further in depth on a lot of what we saw in Saturday's action. But Daniel, I'll just pass it along to you as as. It, it, you, you don't have to really uh, read between the lines too hard to, to address the elephant in the room right now uh, in the Penn State football from a personnel perspective. Definitely. It was something that, you know, when when Matt reported that earlier in the week, uh, kind of gave us a little bit of clarity to some of the things we'd been hearing. And coming into Saturday, it, it really gave us something to to look for and you know, to kind of factor into when really watching, um, you know, this team and kind of going with the expectation moving forward that, um, you know, Keandre Lambert Smith might not be part of this program as opposed as opposed to, you know, that future just kind of lingering out there and having to qualify everything that we see with, well, what what, what would this look like if, if Lambert Smith comes back? But, um, you know, we didn't get any direct comments from James Franklin or the players um, about this. Uh, I did ask Liam Clifford a, a kind of general question where I said, you know, this wide receiver room is going to look different uh, come August because of the portal, you know, comings and goings and just the way that college football is. So I asked him how the room kind of deals with that. 
and how they approach that. Um, and he said, quote, we're just focusing on the guys that are here that are in our room. But again, we're never going to shy away from competition. And that's something we've always ever since last year ended. And now the spring as well have really focused on. It's allowed of it's allowed a lot of guys to grow through it because of it. And I think that that's a kind of similar theme that we heard. Um, from Drew Aller, from Caden Saunders, and Liam Clifford. Saunders and Clifford were the two wide receivers made available to us after this game. You know, they talked a lot about growth. Um, they talked a lot about you know, their confidence uh, in in the development, how they're going to approach this offseason. Um, and while I think that we're in kind of the 2022 offensive line uh, stage with this wide receiver group, where you know, until we see it, it's are we going to, we're not going to expect to see it necessarily. They got to prove it. Um, but I think that talking to, to Liam Clifford, you know, hearing Caden Saunders, hearing Drew Aller, um, I think that there's a, a certain level of confidence there. I wrote about that on lines 247com I know that some people that went through last season aren't, mm. you know, they don't want to read this anymore. They don't want to read your words, anybody <laughs> words. They don't want to hear ours, but we're going to be talking a lot about this receiver group. We're going to be writing a lot about this receiver group. It's yeah. just the way it is. People want to see it, but, you know, I did think that there are some pretty interesting comments uh, about it from, you know, players, James Franklin, you know, actual wide receivers in that room. And so, it's, you know, we'll, we'll see how this changes uh, moving forward. Um, again, it's something we'll get into more of, but but such a strange season last year for Keandre Lambert Smith. He was living up to that moniker early in September of big play. Dre, remember coming off of a big Rose Bowl performance with some highlight real moments later in, in that 2022 season. Um, but first five game, or first nine games, 51 receptions, 645 yards, four touchdowns combined. The last four matchups, including the Peach Bowl. Uh, two catches, 28 yards total are for Keandre Lambert Smith. And, and we've referenced this a few times on the podcast. It's part of why this is such a murky situation, why it's been even before the last few days, something that we've all been wondering how it was going to play out here is we haven't heard from Keandre Lambert Smith. And I think you, you pegged it down to November 8th, right? Uh, that was the last time, which was midweek of the Michigan week last November. So just before they, uh, they lost their second game just before Mike Yursich is fired as the offensive coordinator. You know, we have not heard from Keandre Lambert Smith in a media setting since Mike Yursich was fired. So it, it kind of puts it in perspective of how much has gone down and how much we really don't know about his mindset you know, beyond what his teammates know about and what his coaches, those who really know him. But you know, in the media, say what you will about the media. We're, we're often the, the way that the, the average fan gets their information, starts to build kind of a foundational knowledge of who a player is and what their personality is like. And I know that players have a lot more control of that. They have their own podcast. They have their own you know, video streaming. They have their own uh, social media voices, and that's fantastic. But um, hopefully we'll get to hear Keandre Lambert Smith's story and, and what went down in the last five, six months, whether we get to tell it or someone on the Penn State beat gets to tell it or it's a, something that on the next college beat we get to hear about. Because uh, we all have a lot of questions, and this creates another question for the receiver room. But on the bright side and on the very positive note here is Harrison Wallace looked fantastic when he had his opportunities, Daniel. He is somebody that we heard so much good about last year, right around this time as a redshirt sophomore. By the time we work our way through preseason camp, he's definitely locked in as a starter. He leads the team in receptions in week one against West Virginia. And that's really the last time it felt like we saw a complete performance from him from a health standpoint which is so unfortunate because we get to the Peach Bowl and you start peeling back the layers and getting a little bit more candid answers from guys. And Theo Johnson says, look, we all were viewing you know, Harrison Wallace as, as wide receiver one. And we never heard anyone go on the record with that kind of a comment in August or September. But then you're hearing about it in retrospect. And he looked like maybe that kind of a presence. What I can say is in game action to this point with Drew Aller, he has looked – more comfortable throwing the ball in Harrison Wallace's direction and more on time with those passes than passing the ball, distributing it to anybody else that's been a part of this offense under his watch as, as the starting quarterback. I thought that Trey Wallace looked really, really fluid and, and really explosive today. I think that when we talked about him early last year, uh, especially that West Virginia game, uh, I think we described it as I felt a little bit more station to station um, he was in that Parker Washington role, moving the chains. Um, you know, it, it didn't really, I don't think he did much after the catch in that game. Um, but early in this game, you saw him 
you know, get out of a break, grab a ball, shed a, a Colin Dinkins tackle and get an 18 yard gain. He had that really nice catch along the sideline. Um, you know, we didn't see anything quite like his uh, jump ball touchdown, I believe two years ago in the blue white game. Um, but, you know, Harrison Wallace, I, I think, looked kind of like he had taken a, a bit of a step. Um, he looked a little bit shiftier, uh, I thought. And, you know, we've we've said it a lot. You know, we've heard so much about him even before what you were hearing in December, like the way that they James Ranklin would talk about him mm-hmm. and the way that whenever the offensive struggles came up last year, how Harrison Wallace being out was always factored in. Um, and so if he can be what, James Franklin has kind of framed him as and what if he can live up to how Theo Johnson and some of those guys in Atlanta were talking about him. um, I think that it could really make a difference for that wide receiver group. Um, But I just thought, you know, Wallace just looked really, really solid today. Um, It was kind of a, you know, I don't want to say it was a a surprise, but, you know, we haven't seen these guys in game action (laughs) since, uh, since December, you know, those looks on practice, it, it's kind of hard to tell a lot. Um, but to see him with a defensive, with a defensive back lined up across from him, what he was able to do, you know, five catches, 72 yards. Uh, I came away being like, okay, yeah, this is something that I can see Penn State working with moving forward. So he had seven catches for 72 yards in the season opener last year against West Virginia. And then it just close out the year in a game in which no receiver caught a pass until the fourth quarter. He actually finished that game against Ole Miss with four receptions for 67 yards and a touchdown. Um, and, and that connection between him and, and Aller you know, shows up in a big way. We've heard about it from Drew. And I, I don't think we've had a ch- chance much lately to hear from Harrison Wallace about their relationship. But I know the comfort level between those guys just last year, uh, they got a lot of work in together when Harrison Wallace was still kind of waiting in the wings. And the same went for Drew Aller when you had Sean Clifford here on campus. And that is carried over into the first team unit. So Harrison Wallace, his availability, his health, I mean, feel doesn't it feel like kind of a similar refrain to what we discussed with Julian Fleming? You have this confidence right now because you have this health, but there's a, a trust factor is will you sustain it through preseason camp? through September, through October, and then ultimately deep into December with this new college football playoff structure and then into January. It's a long time to be able to be available, and that's been a rough thing for both of those guys. And uh, with you know Keandre Lambert-Smith now likely to move on, we are you know circling these two guys more and more. Uh, I think someone else in that receiver room has clearly emerged. We've heard a lot of good things this spring, which is really fantastic here because you haven't necessarily seen it come to fruition in an offensive structure and game action yet for him. Caden Saunders, former top 100 prospect from the two, 2022 class, Ohio native like Drew Aller. Those two got a chance to connect a few times as recruits in their home state. So there was some buzz about them coming to campus together. And we caught up with Caden Saunders after this matchup. He ended up uh, on the day with two catches for 27 yards, but he had six targets. He did have a, one notable drop where he could have collected some serious yardage after the catch on that one, but he had a 30-yard pickup. It was one of the big gainers of the day, and this is somebody to me where that yak, that yard after catch, and, and you're looking where it can come from in this offense uh, with Andy Kotelnicki. To me, it's Caden Saunders, and a cool thing about where he can pick that yardage is up give it to him two, three yards ahead of the line of scrimmage, give it to him behind the line of scrimmage. I think he'll find a way to do it. The explosiveness looks like it's come back to his game. I know it's something he's really worked on uh, with, with his offseason training. It's something that, that Penn State's been focused on. And he also is feeling very confident about being a punt returner again. Uh, not that he's taken time away from being a punt returner, but he kind of got the hook last year because of what Daquan Hardy did. And what he learned from Hardy is play fast. You know, he's feeling confident. He feels like he'll be able to take some chances. But I know what they really like about him as a staff is his ability to, to, to avoid those 15-yard losses when the ball bounces and gets away from you and rolls down the field. They really have a lot of trust in him. And that's great. But as a former top 100 prospect who was billed as this you know dynamic kind of playmaker, that's what you want to see as a redshirt sophomore from Caden Saunders. And we saw a 30-yard pickup today. And this is a guy, I think, that exits spring camp with you know the wind behind his back. And, and really, for the first time in his career, a, 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 a kind of a, a true across the board, what you hear on him is a step has been taken. Listening back to uh, some, of, some of the audio from Caden Saunders, he sounds really, really excited about what he can do in this Andy Kotelnicki offense. And I think that 
in terms of looking at some of the stuff that Kodal Nikki did at Kansas and what we've kind of been hearing in terms of a lot of motions, shifts, um, moving guys horizontally to distress communication. Caden Saunders seems like the type of guy that you know, can stress a defense and put him in space, give him an inch. Um, he can go a mile. Penn State did take its first deep shot to him up the left sideline. Uh, Aller, Aller took the took the you know Aller said that he overthrew him on that one. Um, but you know to kind of see that, see them chuck it deep early um, during the blue white game, I thought was I thought was something that we I would heard see. what you did there. I heard <laughs> what you did there. Uh, and then and we got that. Um, but yeah, I think that Caden Saunders is someone where you know we've kind of been waiting for that light to really go on. Um, you know, Liam Clifford said that he and Saunders have had some really, really good competition over these past couple of years when they've both been in the slot. Um, so we'll see how this bears out. Um, you know, I think that Saunders is someone that just has that recruiting pedigree and um, seems to have his head on straight in terms of what he wants to accomplish. And I think that having the experience that he did during his first two years, I think has probably been pretty influential on, on how he approaches things here. So We'll see what that looks like moving forward. But you know, he was someone else too today that he kind of came away with being like, okay, like I can, I can see it uh, mm-hmm. right now. And it's also worth mentioning that uh, kind of how the teams were split up um, that even though a lot of the starters we expect to see uh, were on the white team, uh, which Caden Saunders, Trey Wallace, uh, et cetera, were, were on. Um, and there were some depth uh, pieces, depth defensive backs on the other side. Jalen Kimber and AJ Harris were the the first two corners out, um, you know, for that blue team. So guys like Saunders, Clifford, and Wallace did see some guys that could potentially be starting this fall. Wallace uh, drew a, a pass interference against Kimber at one point, um, and this was during a two minute drill situation where we're seeing Drew Aller again target this guy n- number six Harrison Wallace uh, he also had a 20 yard catch on a fourth and 15 situation and and James Franklin was kind of reiterating a few things after the game and I don't even know if I've mentioned the final score that kind of shows <laughs> me that we're, the context that that we are viewing this it's it's truly kind of just the chance to see action on the field a scrimmage action versus just seeing ball security drills and, and you know uh, individual positional drills like we typically do on a weekly basis we appreciate the weekly look but this is a, a true you know football sense of, of of where penn state is and so sorry if we didn't give the score it was 27 nothing the uh, team white took this one and it was not the equalized uh <laughs> roster situation that we kind of anticipated like i think we we promoted that a bit uh going into the matchup sorry about that we we Heard from James Franklin on Tuesday that, that that was their intention was to really find balance and, um, you know, not not kind of front load positions to one spot. But I think we saw some serious front loading. I think you saw most of the, the, the guys we consider two deep offensive linemen on Team White. Um, you know, that's going to impact the situation. Uh, we, we, you know, conversely, on, t- on Team White, we also saw uh, some uh, some serious edge rushing talent. Abdul Carter, Denai Dennis Sutton uh, among them. And, and, and so we'll get to those defensive ends in a second. But really, uh, on a lot of spots, there was a mismatch in place for Team Blue. It was reflected in the final score, 27 to nothing. But the reason I wanted to bring up the score, Daniel, is as I get back to the the, the first point here, uh, it was late in the game. It was 20 to nothing. And you're like, what, what is Team White doing? Are they pouring it on? Every rep matters. You're, you're trying to stack up at the squeeze, the final remaining moments of your spring practice. These windows are so valuable for every coach. Every film rep is so important. Every opportunity to prove yourself uh, in a competitive atmosphere in, in front of a public setting is vital to a lot of these young players. So, you know, they're trying to work it like a two minute drill to get another touchdown drive. And, and Mark sent us uh, an interesting note here. Mark Brennan, as, as we're working through this podcast, he said on that drive, you know, and Penn State's treating it like they're trying to get a go-ahead touchdown or, or a game-tying score to be able to force overtime and, and the game's on the line. Uh, it, it was uh, Tyler Warren you know, t- getting veteran treatment like Nick Singleton did today. They didn't play. Catron Allen banged up. He didn't play. So, so a lot of the pieces that Aller will have at his disposal not necessarily involved here. But on that drive, he had six total targets through the air, Daniel. Uh, four of them went in the direction of Andrew Rapier. I mentioned a, a couple of them going to, to uh, Harrison Wallace, pass interference, a 20-yard pickup. But how about this? Rapier gets a couple that, that, that you know, going complete, but he also has two catches. Uh, one of them is a 30-yard touchdown that caps off the day for Team White, gets into the end zone. But Rapier, to me, 
in the absent with, with Tyler Warren being an observer, we know he's locked in as a starter. We're wondering how many two tight end sets we'll see. We didn't see them today. If we did, they were few and far between, at least as far as I could tell. This is a guy who was playing a lot more, uh, uh, getting a lot more, uh, I guess, opportunities to prove himself than it felt like Khalil Dinkins was, who's a year, you know, a year ahead of him, actually two years ahead of him. We didn't see Jerry Cross involved today uh, on the field. Uh, that, that was kind of the theme for him the last couple of times. We got to look at practice, which is great for the redshirt sophomore, but feels like, again, stock up for Andrew Rapier, something we've been trying to, to, to hammer home at lines 247com And I think something that was on display over the course of Saturday afternoon. Definitely. Rapelier is just such a, a big physical presence out there. Um, there was one play I remember in the, the first half, I believe, where he whiffed on a block and uh, Antoine Belgrave shorter uh, could have put a, a pretty big hit on Bo Perbula. Um, But, you know, for the most part, I think that Rapelier is, is maybe one of these you know, second year players who has the chance to make the biggest move, I think, um, up the depth chart with given you know what was ahead of him last year what's still ahead of him and and how he's developed so i i think that he was someone that coming in you really wanted to see uh get game action uh he finished with eight targets which is the most for for either team so whether it was Prabula or aller quarterbacking that white team you know they were willing to look for him um so i moving forward he is i think he has the chance to really grow into a contributor over the course of the season I think depending on how it shapes up at wide receiver, what Andy Nicole and Nicky wants to do, uh, you know, once he wants to lean on, I guess, from a kind of schematic standpoint, he's got a chance to be more than a contributor this year. I mean, uh, we've seen them start two tight ends with regularity the last couple of years. He's going to have to earn that. Khalil Dinkins isn't going down without a fight. Those wide receivers, they want they want to have three of them out there from that group as often as possible. But I think he's physically there. And you see him when that ball's in his hand. He, he understands how to turn up field and, and not just maybe, you know, run by some guys and he can, he can run by some guys, but he can, he brings a physicality to the situation. Um, and, and there's just a lot to like about what he could bring to their overall offensive plan next this upcoming fall. And I think we saw a little bit of that. Um, we'll talk about the quarterbacks in a moment. The guys are actually getting the ball out and about, but I think at running back, you, we, we understand why as of now, the RB3 conversation really centers on two players, the red shirt freshman Cam Wallace and then true freshman early enrollee Quentin Martin. London Montgomery may have had like the highlight run of the day. I think it was 11 yard scamper where he showed off some agility. Uh, other than that, you know, pretty well contained. He wasn't running behind the alpha offensive line uh, uh, on the field there. But I think Cam Wallace showed what he could do. Quentin Martin didn't get many opportunities, but two two rushes to the end zone. Uh, one of them, as as Mark Brennan pointed out, untouched. Um, we named him our offensive MVP, and I did that because he scored two touchdowns. That's a pretty good day for you. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the storyline here is, Daniel, that, that you've got two running backs who I think have answered the bell through spring ball here for J1 Sider with Trey Potts moving on to the NFL with Nick Singleton and Katron Allen getting a veteran treatment here, dealing with little bumps and bruises as well in the spring. There's been a bunch of reps to distribute between these guys. And unfortunately for Quentin Martin, he didn't hold up physically throughout that. James Franklin said there were some availability issues with him and couldn't really get a full evaluation of him this spring based on that. I mean, he was absent from a couple of practices. So because of that, I feel like Cam Wallace, Quentin Martin, and then you got Lennon Montgomery. You've got the incoming Corey Smith as a freshman playing some catch up here. Walk ons are going to be involved there too. But I, it's kind of an exciting battle. And it's one that you pointed out when we were going into this matchup. Cam Wallace was the first running back out there uh, with Drew Aller, I believe. And so, you know, we know that, um, you know, he's done a lot of work since he's got here. We've talked a lot about how he's changed his body. And I think that when you saw him out there, um, against some of those defenders, seeing him next to some defensive linemen, um, some defensive backs some linebackers, you can see that he looks the part um, like he belongs. Uh, he did. He had a nice six yard catch out of the backfield at one point um, and, and just seems like a very kind of well-rounded running back um, at, at this point in his career. Um, he's got, and he's got some power to him. I mean, we, we, yeah. knew, we knew the game. I mean, he went from what, 175 to 200 in the mm -hmm. last year. And, and you're seeing that reflected not in him being a slower version of his former self. 
he is a stronger version of his former self and not necessarily a guy that that I would want to get in be- between the end zone with. Definitely. I, I think that you can see him becoming um, that potential all around type back. Um, whereas with, with Quentin Martin, you can kind of see where he has the room to grow. He's got different body type at 6'1", 194. Um, he kind of almost looks like a wide receiver out there a little bit. Um, and James Franklin has talked about how um, I think it was Franklin talked about how Martin came in a little bit more raw than they were expecting. Um, but they've been able to to work with that and develop it. And I think for him to be in this position shows that. So, you know, I think we didn't see, uh, but I mean, both of these guys have real potential to be Swiss army knives for Andy Kotelnicki. Obviously today was incredibly vanilla. Um, mm-hmm. You mentioned it. I don't think we saw anything other than 11 personnel. Uh, pretty much this entire time. It was just three wide receivers, one tight end, one running back um, for pretty much the entire day. Um, so you know, we'll see how they can creatively use these guys. But I mean, this number three running back competition is, I think it's going to be fun. And I think that if you get into the season and they feel like they can use four, I think they're going to use four um, just because of what they have, You know, keeping Nick Singleton and Katron Allen healthy. Um, and, and doing what's best for the team. I, I think it could be really, really fun on the ground. Uh, again, Quentin Martin, a couple touchdowns. We named him offensive MVP. I think there, there was a strong case to be made for Harrison Wallace. There's no doubt about that. That's what Mark was banging the table for. But the story was already published by the time he was banging the table. You, you'll hear from uh, him Monday. <laughs> yes, Mark, Mark, can, Mark can state his case. And, and I think bef- we'll get over to the defense and, and we'll talk about some of the ins and outs there. We'll, we'll tell you who we ended up landing on MVP. And there was a little debate there as well. But let's go to the quarterbacks. And, 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 and you know, the offensive line situation, Let's let's just kind of bridging the gap with what everyone was dealing with here and no Anthony Donko, uh, which is, you know, significant you know, absence because he's somebody that we've heard fantastic things about all spring practice and going back to peach bowl last year. We think he's going to be in a really good position to be the first right tackle out there uh, come kickoff against West Virginia. But so that meant Nolan Rucci got, uh, got some significant run at right tackle, which is great. Uh, you want that James Franklin was you know, referencing the fact that he got like a thousand reps this year because of the uh, Drew Shelton injury and, and the reps had to go to somebody. Uh, Javen Williams out there at left tackle Venga, uh, Venga Ioane at left guard. It was Cooper Cousins as the first right guard up. Uh, no Sal Wormley. He's someone who was missing from practice as well. He was present. Uh, I want to make you have to make all these things very clear with the transfer portal coming up. Sal Wormley was there, but he was not dressed uh, or he was not out there and involved in game action. So first off, your reaction to Cooper Cousins? Uh, I believe he had a false start in the very first play of the game. So you know, welcome to the big leagues, big fella. Uh, Nick Dawkins alongside him at 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 the center role. Um, our first chance to really see him be the first guy out there. What did you make of the offensive line as much as you can make of the offensive line today? Again, going up against a group of, of solid defensive linemen, but let's be honest, the second wave of Team Blue defensive linemen feature guys that we really don't expect to see much of come you know September, October, and in, in the, in the, when the game's really in, getting the step-up competition. So what did you make of what we got a chance to see, knowing full well that we want to see a little bit more on a game replay? I think that the blue team defensive lineman who flashed the most was Jameel Lyons, which, you know, is one of those things that you look at and you're kind of like, okay, that checks out. Um, He had a couple good reps against the the left side of that uh, line. Uh, I think he got Javen Williams uh, at least once. Um, But I I think that some of this goes back to Phil Troutwine, just a testament that he's done to recruiting and developing along that offensive line. I mean, you think about the guys who didn't suit up today, Drew Shelton, JB Nelson, Sal Wormley, Anthony Donka, or guys that suit up or, or didn't yeah. play. I mean, all four of those guys could start next year. Like you're starting five this against year. West this year. Yeah. Our, yeah. The, the starting five against West Virginia could be those four guys and Nick Dawkins. So, and the fact that what they rolled out there you know, today wasn't you know it wasn't necessarily that the highest level but it also wasn't necessarily a group that come august like if that was the first five out there i wouldn't feel the worst about it um because nolan rucci has experience um venga yoane has a ton of experience you still have dawkins in there we know where the arrow is pointing for cooper cousins um you know i think that the fact that phil troutwine has really you know, put together a, a real kind of nine, 10 deep 
um, for his for his group. That is really, really impressive. So I, I think that was kind of my first takeaway was mm-hmm. looking at who wasn't there and still seeing what was there and, and st- still feeling pretty good about it. Um, you know, I do think that Javen Williams, you can you can see the skills there. You can see that they trust him. Um, there's a little bit of a, of work in progress that is still there, I think. Um, but we heard some good things about him. You know, Deny Dennis Sutton um, earlier this week had some praise for Javen Williams and the work that he's done. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm curious to see how this offensive line comes along. You know, I thought that they were solid today. You know, there's also the thing that you factor in where you know these quarterbacks aren't getting hit. So maybe they're holding on to a ball longer than they normally would. Maybe they're not necessarily as being, well, we know that Bo Perbulo is being as, as evasive as he normally is, but maybe Drew Aller and Ethan Gronkemeyer aren't necessarily bailing from the pocket um, at pressure as, as quick as they would be to, to stand in there and, and try to get a throw in. Um, but, you know, looking at Cooper Cousins out there, you know, it seems like that he's been playing for years, just how he looks physically standing next to Nick Dawkins and, and Nolan Rucci. Um, you know, I kind of liked what I saw from Rucci today. Going to have to go back and see more. Um, you know, I think that Ioane, I think, is probably going to be, I feel like Ioane and Dawkins are probably going to come out as big winners from the spring in terms of the amount of reps they've been able to get. Um, Ioane's so- a freak. Ioane, like, let's just establish <laughs> that. Like, we'll, we'll see where he is fundamentally, but this guy is a freak. And, and Andy Kodal Nicky likes to use Lyman in different ways, like in motion before the snap. Yeah. And then, but this guy is 345 ish pounds. And we saw him pull today and, and go from left guard to pass protection on the right side is something I noticed. And and I, I'm sorry to in, uh, interrupt you there, okay, but I, I saw that play and I, I forgot to like even mention it to you. I forgot to <laughs> write it down, but he's a freak and i just i'm excited to see what he can do he had almost 700 snaps last year but we had him on a call this week you were on it with me and uh, he's just somebody that sounds super confident and kind of establishing himself as a leader which they need in that offensive line room uh more guys more voices and uh, excited to see what's next for him he's not coming off the field but maybe cooper cousins is gonna have a hard time coming off the field as well yeah it's it, there's just a lot on that interior right now. You know, when you think of also about JB Nelson and Sal Wormley, um, you're you're gonna have to to maybe you have to figure it out. You know, it's kind of a Alex Birchmeyer got a bunch of reps today. Like like yes. these are all like we're, we have all these guys we're talking about, and you went on for for a longer time than than I would have because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go with James Franklin on this. I want to I want to kind of get a chance to go back and review the film before I you know go too far down the path because so much about this matchup. You're right. It may look like a full on football game, but when the quarterback's untouchable um, and also in this matchup, I'm looking at the stat sheet for a lot of the, the team blue defense that went against this group. A lot of walk on names on that list you know, and <laughs> yes. a lot of younger names on that list. And so let's go through and, and it's going to be fun to kind of instead of focusing on the full 11 on 11 aspect of what we witnessed a little more one on one or two on one uh, or two on two in the trenches. When we get a chance to watch this, it was on Big Ten Network, and I didn't get it. I had no idea how many, how their camera work was. I'm hoping it was really <laughs> solid because, again, we get a 10 minute window of practice. They don't hand us a you know a DVD. They don't uh, send us over a file of what the rest of practice looked like. So this is a real chance to see repetition after repetition and how guys are responding to moments of adversity and so especially in the trenches so i think i'm personally okay with leaving it there with the offensive line conversation for now but we saw a lot of guys involved and it'll be cool to see what exactly phil troutwine does with his deck of cards when this team goes to west virginia and i've been saying it for a long time i'm going to stand by it now not going to be surprised one bit if seven, maybe eight guys are involved in that offensive line by the end of the first half of that season opener. Definitely. There's really, this is as close as you can get to saying that it's a a good problem to have having that many, that many uh, potential offensive linemen. And I don't know if I don't know enough about the tackles though. I don't know. I don't, this isn't me saying, Oh, this this team is just is, is loaded. Forget about the offensive line. If you have any worries, it's just it's taken care of. They got bodies. They got a lot of ath- athletic specimens. They got guys that I think are bought into the culture, but we just don't know from that tackle group yet. And unfortunately today, not seeing Anthony Donko this spring, not seeing Drew Shelton. That doesn't really help us with that knowledge. But let's go back. Let's see what it looked like on film with with, with guys like Javen Williams, Nolan Rucci, Chim Diono when they had their opportunities out there on Saturday. 
Yeah, it's body's potential and varying amounts of experience. And if it clicks, as the, a high ceiling, but the lights are going to come on at in Morgantown, and it's going to be a you know, a power four team on the other side. I know that the, the person who hopes that it works out the most for that offensive line is, is Drew Aller because because they're going to be really important to his health and his success as a junior quarterback. And uh, let's talk about the quarterbacks a little bit here before we dive into the situation on defense. And we'll, we'll preface it with this. This was about as windy of a condition as I felt walking into a, the, to the Beaver Stadium uh, game day atmosphere ever. I mean, whether it was the, a fall game, uh, early fall, late fall, what have you, spring games in the past, it was a sustained win. Now, my understanding was it's hard to tell from the press box was that it went from like that sustained insane win where the flags are straight to more of a gusty situation where it was just that, you know, you, you were okay and then a huge gust would come through and it was settled down by the time we left Beaver Stadium later. But clearly that's going to impact what you can accomplish in the passing game, Daniel. With that out in the open now, let's go through a little bit of, of what went down. Drew Aller finished 15 of 32, 202 yards, one touchdown. It was that 30-yard pass to Andrew Rapelier, uh, as we mentioned earlier. Um, you also uh, saw Bo Prabula involved for both teams. He had five of 10 on the day. He had an interception. Uh, could have had another interception. It would have been a pick six for Colin Dinkins, who uh, the younger brother, a walk-on of, uh, of Khalil Dinkins, had himself quite a day. I mean, he was very active out there for Team Blue, um, and he almost had a pick six, but it didn't go down in the books because of uh, it was ruled a sack on Bo Perbula. Ethan Grunkemeyer was four of eight, 11 yards. He had an interception as well. One of the – a throw that he should not have put up there. It'll be a learning uh, a learning experience for him. It was intercepted by Amin Vanover. And then uh, Jack Lambert, who's a walk-on member of the team, uh, threw one pass in, in this game. So – Daniel, the stats are what the stats are. It's really hard to work your way through a stat sheet from a spring game and, and, and say this means a ton. But what did you make of the overall body of work you saw from these quarterbacks? How do you feel about the depth chart situation? And we'll mention this, Jackson Smolik ruled out for, for a, you know an indefinite period of time by James Franklin, confirming during spring ball that he suffered a significant injury. He was out there in pregame warm-ups throwing the ball, uh, was not moving his lower half of the body, though. Uh, he was out there. He wasn't using crutches. He wasn't on a boot. But we noticed that there was some supportive stuff going on with his left leg. So we'll see what the process, the timeline looks for, like for him. We don't know if he'll be a available for this team in 2024 or not so with that caveat what did you think I, I felt that there was some room for growth I, I think that you see it from Aller that you know, when he's really really confident and when he is throwing to someone like Harrison Wallace uh, you can really see that connection you can really see um, him make some really really impressive throws uh, at other times it kind of looked like last year a little bit um, you know, at the same time, this is that setting like we talked about in terms of, you know, how he's approaching things in terms of the pressure. You know, we don't necessarily know what he's trying to accomplish on some of these plays where, um, you know, this is a practice setting where you might force something in the coverage to try something um, or, or work on something. But, yeah, I think that it was kind of a, a similar hour to the one that we saw in practice in terms of you know, looking a little bit more leaner, still really being able to sling it um, and he, and kind of showing off his ceiling a little bit that, I mean, if he, if he'd hit on that one deep ball to Saunders, I think that that would have been a kind of a, a real boost uh, to the day for, for everyone there and kind of moving into like the, the missing offense. highlight from the day for Penn state, right? Uh, this the, exactly. the deep ball connection running. Into the, I know they have one with uh, a but you're right. That, that kind of, that kind of a throw, that kind of a in stride mm -hmm. moment. I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, and I think with Prabula, I think that it's kind of it was also what we saw last year in terms of a lot of running and not necessarily a lot of throwing. And I think that you know, we talked about it that offensive line in front of him uh, was not the A team. And you know when Abdul Carter is essentially in the backfield, by the time that you are taking that shotgun snap, can make things a, a little bit difficult. Um, but I thought that. You know, the interception that Zachy Wheatley reeled in was 
a, a tough, tough to it's just tough. Miscommunication. To I think it's a miscommunication. That's another yeah. one where I go and watch the replay. I think yeah. it looked like maybe a downfield community. And we didn't even mention Julian Fleming. I, I believe that was intended <laughs> yeah. for Julian Fleming. We people are like, did Julian is Julian Fleming on the team? Because you guys talk so much about him. Yes, he's on the team. Sorry, I just should mention him now before we don't. Daniel, he had mm-hmm. a, a one reception for five yards. He was involved early out there. I think he got overall pretty veteran treatment on the day. I don't think yeah. he had a high rep total. And and knock on wood here, got through spring ball healthy, and that's huge. You know, cleared a hurdle for himself, talked about his self-confidence being built. And we heard it after this game from Caden Saunders. We've heard it all spring ball from coaches, from players on the record, off the record. He has had an influence in this receiver room. He has emerged as a leader for this receiver room for the offensive unit. And I think by the time they play West Virginia, he's going to be viewed as a leader for this locker room. So look beyond the box score, Julian Fleming's impact, and look at the fact that he was unfortunately not paired with Drew Aller. That was one of those dynamics I'd hope we see. Uh, It became the Harrison Wallace and Drew Aller show and Andrew Rapier becoming a a, a guy highly involved there. But we'll have to wait and see uh, until fall when it comes to Fleming and and Aller hooking up in, in Beaver Stadium. Yeah, I think Fleming got the modified veteran treatment yes. where Tyler Warren and Nick Singleton got the true veteran treatment. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that Aller and Prabula, I mean, you saw kind of the the areas for growth um, and, you know, kind of building on what we saw last year. Um, you know, Grunkemeyer, the ball still looks good coming out of his hands. He had a really tough decision uh, that led to the Amin Vanover Panic interception. Moment. Yeah. Panic moment. Yeah. And it happens. You're a true it's freshman. Practice. You're, you're a college freshman. True freshman and a fifth year senior. Uh, you know, and well, Vanover's downfield, but there's just you got a lot of traffic around you, a lot of veteran guys. Mills stuff. was the one crashing on that play, right? Tyrese Mills, who we saw involved in a lion yeah. role. He's somewhere, he's been stuck somewhere in between safety and linebacker his whole career. And so this is probably the perfect role for him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess I guess we'll get to that in a little bit. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that it's hard to take too too much away. I think that quarterback is especially one of those positions where when people caution the amount of conclusions to draw from this i think that that's kind of that's the approach i'm taking with that position yeah and so uh, let's face it they didn't win over a lot of people when it comes to the passing attack today but i don't think uh andy kotelnicki was dealing with his uh his fastball as well as a as a play caller in a practice setting uh against his own staff um so i can't wait to see what it looks like because there's going to be a lot of pre-snap components to this that are going to kind of wow people i think there's going to be a lot of stuff that that puts defenses on edge and forces them to make really fast decisions and especially early on in the season it could really really special to watch but you also have to have the quarterback distributing the ball and and, and let's face it when when the misses were there again and a lot like we saw last year it was high with, with drew aller uh, over the course of the day he's not a guy who's going to short you know skip the ball to you but uh we'll, we'll look we'll look at what um drew aller can do come game action game action in, in the fall but this was a little bit of peeling back that curtain just to see where he and this group are at uh, let's look over at the defense now daniel will spend less time on them um but we're gonna give them their proper due because there were some standouts and the defensive end position is a spot that we've been pointing to for a long time even though you lose two nfl talents in Adiza Isaac, in Chop Robinson, you feel really good about the health of that spot. Uh, Deion Barnes, a former standard edge rusher with the Nittany Lions himself, now running the roost in the defensive a defensive line room for the last couple of years, has done a fantastic job there. The Nye Dennis Sutton, Amin Vanover were the first two defensive ends we saw up today for Team White. Again, they were playing with the stacked deck today against Team Blue. They also had uh, Abdul Carter coming in off the edge as a as a the, the second option within this plan. And Daniel, I mean, we saw it. Uh, Amin Vanover is the guy that we gave the defensive MVP nod to because James Franklin, unsolicited, gave him a shout out in his opening statement. Really proud of this kid. He played eight games last year. He was the fifth most used defensive end. But now here in year five, he clearly senses he's got a moment to seize. Uh, today he had an interception downfield, uh, which was a pretty rare thing for any defensive lineman uh, off the, the throw from Grunkemeyer that we talked about. He also had a sack in the game. Uh, we could have gone a few different ways in defensive line, but it's cool to start here with the mean van over at defensive end because we got a few guys to get here. And I think it illustrates just how diverse, dynamic, and deep they can be at this spot when we lead off this topic with Amin Vanover, who's probably gotten the least amount of discussion from us this mm-hmm. offseason. 
Yeah, I think Amin Vanover and to a, a lesser extent, Zariah Fisher, who was in street clothes today, they're kind of forgotten uh, a little bit in that defensive line room or defensive end group because you lose Chop Robinson and Adisa Isaac. Deny Dennis Sutton seems poised for a big year. And then you've got Jameel Lyons coming up as the young guy. And then you have Abdul Carter, you know, bumping down. And we all know the reputation that Abdul Carter has that when you kind of go through things in your head, it can be kind of easy to squeeze out Amin Vanover and Zariah Fisher. Um, but, you know, Amin Vanover is someone that has had a, a couple different roles on the defensive line during his career at Penn State. I think he was a defensive tackle for a little bit earlier in his career. Um, I remember in some of the you know Brent rare Brent Pry three man yeah. defensive fronts, he would he was at the nose uh, in in passing situations, and so he's kind of paid his dues, uh, you know, worked around. But you know when he's been in the field, we we've seen him make an impact. Like he is one of those players that when he's out there in limited snaps, it seems like he's around the quarterback. It seems like he's around the ball. Um, you know, I don't know if he's the if you know maybe he wants to prove now that he can be a three down the three down defensive end someone that you never want to take off the field but in the limited sample size we've had of him he, he can be someone who can make a lot of things happen be really disruptive um so i thought that seeing him perform today uh you know it's kind of cool i mean it's a he's a fifth year senior someone who's been around for a lot you know the type of guy that you know i think from the outside when someone's been here for five years and you don't see them as a starter you don't see them as a you know, the significant contributor, like you said, he was the the fifth defensive end last year. It can be kind of easy to write those guys off sometimes. Um, but I think that for him to, you know, have this, this kind of spring game to show what he's been doing, you know, Zariah Fisher is someone who got shouted out in winter workouts a ton um, and was, had the most on the defensive line. You know, these guys are, are still here. They still want to contribute and they can make things happen when they're on the field. And they're just, part of the puzzle here because you've got denied Dennis Sutton who if you know if there was any concern about him earlier that was one of the first couple practices that we got out there for he was in the full go out there and you're wondering okay was he okay he was chasing after the quarterback and getting a sack in like the final minute of this game when it was 20 to nothing or 27 to nothing whatever it was so yeah he's just fine he, he was being used at the very end of this matchup uh, so denied that Sutton, I think, is going to really take off as a junior, stepping up. He, he led this group in game snaps last year. Uh, but Jameel Lyons continues to be the one that's gone from being whispered about to kind of being shouted out now. I mean, it, it's not even a secret that he is an emerging presence, and you got to figure out where the snaps come from in this unit. But they're going to get them to Jameel Lyons. He came up with a sack today. Uh, he was you know, probably the lead defender in that front seven of the defense for that team blue. When you were looking through the roster and looking at some of the performers, he was probably the guy that stood out the most from the front seven on team blue and James Franklin while going out of his way to talk about, I mean, Vanover in his opening statement followed immediately to say how much Jameel Lyons has flashed and how that continued on Saturday. And it feels like every time we ask an offensive lineman or defensive lineman, Daniel, the entire spring, who's the guy that's jumping out to you? One of the younger guys who they don't take, they don't blink. Oh, it's Jameel. It's Jameel. And here's why. And it's always the same reasons. Relentless, explosive, you know, a lot like what you hear about denying Dennis Sutton in terms of competitive nature, treats practices like the Super Bowl. And with this guy, the twitchiness he brings off the edge, he's still relatively lanky for his frame. And, and when you look at him compared to some of the other defensive ends, so think about what he could be next year. But right now he matters and he's going to be a weapon for this defense. Abdul Carter had an interesting uh, quote about uh, about Jameel Lyons after the game, uh, he was asked, you know, what what he's seen from him and and what Jameel can do on the field, and he said, "quote His effort really stands out. The plays away from him and his run to the ball is probably the best I've seen in a long time. His effort, his athleticism, his range, his bend. He's very athletic, and he's going to be real good for us. And I think that that tracks with the the feedback that we've been getting on Lyons, where." You look at him and you can see the physical gifts um, in terms of how tall he is, how long he is. Um, I think that Chuck Losey last year gave some really good insight into how much bigger they think he can get and how strong Lions is despite having that lankier frame. Um, but that effort part, we hear that a lot, that 
it, it doesn't sound like that Jameel Lyons really leans on on those physical gifts. You know, they're there and they're going to put him in pos- in position, but he couples that with that effort, with you know, putting in the work and like Abdul Carter says, you know, chasing down plays that are away from him. And those are the types of plays that can win you a game here and there, or save a touchdown, or you know, save a big gain late in a game, something like that. Um, so I think the feedback on Lions you know, is one of the things that we like about the blue white game, where the stuff that we hear, you know, mm. for these past five weeks and that we want to see <laughs> at the blue white game, we got to see that with him today. Yeah, they translated and and Curtis Jacobs told me this winter that that he thinks this kid's going to be a first round pick in a future NFL draft down the road. Um, and I know a lot of people are starting to, to feel that he has that kind of potential along the way. I don't know how many snaps he will get this season. We'll even get the 200 game snaps because of what they have at defensive end. And because, you know, it would be good if what we were talking about was what they had stockpile at defensive end. But you remember that you plucked an all big 10 player from the linebacker room and plopped him over at defensive end now as well. And Abdul Carter and, that first step, that get off. I mean, I got a chance to see it a little bit at practice the other day, focused on on a, on a drill they were doing where they were simulating the snap, um, and, and and got to just really sense what it might look like. And now out there with pads, working against an offensive lineman, and you know, again, I think it was a walk on that he was dealing with at the time, but watching him go mano a mano in, in some of these settings and and it was back-to-back plays. I think the first one you were like, was he off sides? And he may <laughs> have been off sides. If he was, they didn't call it. But he pressured the quarterback in that situation. Could have been a, a blow-up kind of play in the backfield. And the very next play, he did deliver a sack, and he was just off the ball so quickly. Uh, Amin Vanover told me after the game that he thinks Abdul Carter has the fastest first step in America. And he said he felt that way about Chop Robinson last year. And if you hear and read some of what the NFL draft analysts in that industry is saying, there's a lot of sentiment to that, what, what Chop Robinson brought to the table last year. Uh, well, if you can get that from Abdul Carter, and we already know the kind of you know specimen he is and production that he provides, but he had 12 sacks his first couple of seasons at a different position. So I think we saw what we needed to see today from Abdul Carter for me to check off the list and say, yeah, I'm buying into what's going to happen for him at defensive end over the course of these next five, six, seven months. When you go back and, and rewatch the game, you're going to be slowing it down to, to see if he was offsides <laughs> or not. But yeah, I I agree with you that we saw that first step. We saw how dynamic he is. Um, I do think that it's going to be interesting what it looks like against when it's not Egan Boyer, um, you know, the, a 250 pound uh, left tackle. And it's against some of these real big 10 offensive lines, but you know, Abdul Carter has shown that he can rush the passer 11 sacks in his first two years after the blue white game today. He said that one of the bigger adjustments is you don't get that downhill running start uh, anymore, that you're up and you're immediately engaged uh, with the offensive lineman. That first step can help mitigate that a little bit. But I think the thing with Abdul Carter that stands out, and I wrote about this in a piece Friday on Lions 24-7, really kind of looking at um, Carter's move from all angles, is that the the coachability part and his willingness to, to learn I think really shines through two different players, uh, Zane Durant and Devon Ali's both called him a sponge. uh, And those interviews were, I think three weeks apart. Um, So that's the word that comes to people's mind when talking about Carter. Uh, And he talked about it today that, you know, any chance he gets, he's asking those other defensive ends in the room, how to do something. Um, You know, he wants them to give him pointers on, on what he needs to do better, how he can improve. And I think that's really, really big when you're dealing with a player that we already know has these natural gifts and these physical tools, and he's trying to refine those techniques. Um, I, I think that that's huge for Abdul Carter and his development at a at a new position because, you know, we talked about it. James Franklin was, he called it a different world moving down mm-hmm. there. Um, and last week we, we heard him kind of open it up a little bit when it comes to the praise. So after couple more months of working out this off season, getting those, those fall practices in. I think Abdul Carter is positioning himself really, really well to be a big, big part of that pass rush. And how about this? I know we're in a, in a day and age where people kind of lament what's going on and they feel like players are getting selfish and, and they're not caring about the team. 
I mean, Abdul Carter is getting taken care of from an NIL perspective. Let's not let's not beat around the bush there. But you're talking about somebody who is maybe the most recognizable figure probably nationally on this defense. He wasn't part of the first team defense that went out there today in Beaver Stadium. He was on the second wave. He had to wait. He had to watch Amin Vanover and Deny Dennis Sutton out there in the positions. He had to watch Tony Rojas and Kobe King out there at his old spots. And you know, I don't know what that might feel like. It can't feel awesome, but this is a guy that's buying into the process. Clearly, he knew what he was investing in because this was his decision. And I know that they had some pretty detailed conversations about what his path would look like. And as I said, I think he is where he needs to be, if not further ahead of where he needs to be. You made a great point on the podcast a few days ago that James Franklin from the get go in spring ball, the first time he really talked about this position move on the record cautioned everybody, including Abdul Carter, about what this might look like initially. Might not go from a first-team All-Big Ten linebacker to a first-team uh, All-Big Ten defensive end on day one. But he might just get there by the time this season wraps up and, and, and we get to December. He might just get there, Daniel. Uh, excited to see what it looks like. Let's go to the defensive backfield, finish up the conversation with, with a few more call-outs and, and guys that we got to get to. And I think in terms of the safety spots, we've had so much conversation about what that – position group could mean kj winston uh was not practicing today um, we've seen him out there during plenty of practices leading that uh, drill line often but not available today again one of 15 practices they're, they're not going to put any pressure on guys to be involved out there we'll see plenty of kj in the fall but without him there we, we got a sense of that king mac is definitely in next man up kind of territory appears that he was the next guy up and we got our answer on on what they feel about jalen reed with that lion role he was living there for a lot of the afternoon when he was out there on the field. And then Zeki Wheatley naturally does something buzzy because that's all this guy does uh, every single offseason, it seems. And I think he's going to deliver in a big way come this autumn. But he came up with an interception that was about as easy of an interception that he's probably had on the practice field or in game action in his career. And so safety room, while incomplete, we saw some pieces to the puzzle and, and Dakari Nelson got some action on the other side of, of things for team blue. But I think you're really starting to see what the initial two deep could look like, but also how these guys could be utilized as chess pieces. Yeah. And, and the wild card there is Ty Tyrese Mills. <laughs> I think that yeah. we, we got up to the press box and uh, I looked down at the, the safety the safety's warming up and Tyrese Mills is there in line. And it was kind of like, Okay. Let me give the we'll timeline real quick for folks. <laughs> Tyrese Mills, formerly of Lackawanna College, came to campus in 2022 that summer. He played safety at Lackawanna, but they loved his coverage, getting downhill, covering the run, playing in the box. They felt like that's where he could really flourish the most. So he works at the Sam linebacker position in year one. Unfortunately, his year one ended in like mid-August. He suffered an injury out for the entire 22 season. Comes back, refocused at safety to start 2020. Uh, where are we? 2023. Uh, by the time they get through last season, we're at the Peach Bowl in Atlanta. He seems to be running drill work with linebackers. Um, then he's officially listed as a linebacker uh, going into spring ball. And now we see him finish out spring ball at the, at the safety spot. I don't know where he fits in, but he did get some significant run in, in, in that role that we're considering the line position. Um, and, and he remains to me someone that I see on the practice field and I say – he fits in here like he belongs here. It just seems like it's been tricky in terms of finding the pathway to what's, you know, what's going to be on Saturdays for him come fall. Three of the guys on on Team White that we saw at the Lion were Jalen Reed, Cam Miller, Tyrese Mills. Um, you've got it's another one of those things where you've got varying level, levels of experience, a little bit different body types between the three of them, but guys that I think have the potential to hold that down. And I think that when you talk about a hybrid role as kind of a, a linebacker, nickel, defensive back safety, I think that that's something that really lends itself to Tyrese Mills uh, and his skill set. I mean, he had a really nice pressure um, to, to blow up, I believe, that interception that Gronkemeyer threw. Um, Jalen Reed had a really nice pressure at one point. Uh, you can see him. I could see him really flying around. And I think that that could be a lot of fun this fall, mm -hmm. uh, what what he can do there. And then that allows uh, guys like King Mack and Zachy Wheatley to kind of be rangy back there to be ball hawks. Um, it, it's really, really intriguing what this is going to be. I, I think that once we get into the season, it's going to be 
you know, charting those different personnel groups, seeing who they rotate, who they're running in, who they're running off, um, you know, how you find room for all of these safeties, especially if Tyrese Mills is going to be part of that group. Um, it, it can get really, really interesting, I think. We, we talked about uh, Davian Collins uh, being a hot name in the cornerback room and on this team in general for what he accomplished this spring. He was one of the first cornerbacks out there that we saw for Team White, opposite of Cam Miller, uh, the return junior who has more experience than anybody in a Penn State uniform at the at the cornerback position. To me, though, and maybe this will change when I get a chance to review it on the Big Ten replay, but Daniel, I, I was I found myself just drawn to AJ Harris, uh, yeah. and and perhaps it's because the the team White was actually able to move the football downfield, and they were you know you were engaged more with the cornerbacks. Uh, team Blue on the day had sixty nine total yards. Uh, they only had twenty nine passing yards, so it's not like we saw a lot of, of those cornerbacks getting tested throughout the afternoon. AJ Harris had to be active, and so he had seven tackles. I think six of those were before. Uh, halftime, two of them for loss. He had a pass breakup as well. To me, what stands out is the way he finishes through the ball carrier on these tackles. And if you've seen some of the highlights that Penn State has put out from their practices, there are some of those hard hits that he's delivered. Everyone will tell you that the physicality really stands out. James Franklin went so far as to call it an unusual level of physicality for the cornerback position. And I'm all systems go with buying in that the, the former five-star is legitimately a five-star talent that they picked up out of the transfer portal. I, I thought that his pass breakup in the end zone against Malik McLean was a good uh, good way to exhibit that physicality a little bit because he didn't let Malik McLean come back to the ball. Um, you know, he really just kind of walled him off, um, and it was a you know there was a chance for McLean to make the play, and Harris just didn't let him. Um, so I think that that starting competition, how that shakes out. Um, you know, the, you had the first, you know, the first blue the cornerbacks were Harris and Kimber. The first white cornerbacks were Collins and Miller. And then the second uh, cornerbacks for, for Team White were Elliott Washington and Zion Tracy, uh, the safeties who we know have a ton of talent and potential. Um, so sophomores, you've got sophomores. So you sophomores. said safeties. I just want to make sure people aren't like trying to wrap their head. And then, oh, by the way, <laughs> The other back, the other guys, the other connection on the blue was the 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 John Mitchell, Antoine Belgrave. I don't know if we did we see both of those guys involved over the course of the day. Belgrave shorter played, had a pass yeah. breakup. I do not think we saw Mitchell out there. Okay. But those guys waiting in the wing. So again, this is a position where you can kind of stack up different different players and, and work your way through like a four deep that you feel really good about. But uh, again, again, I just felt like AJ Harris to me. Looked like he'd been he'd been around this team for a while. Just the way his he, he was re reacting and and finishing plays. And again, maybe it's because he was tested so much more than the other cornerbacks in this game, uh, because of the, the way this game was stacked up in one way versus the other. But just really loved what we got out of AJ Harris in terms of 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 being able to come out of this game with some evaluation of where a guy's at. Yeah, I think that Harris, you know, we've heard that he can play the lion. We've heard he can play all over the secondary. He looks like someone that you can't keep off the field. Let's uh, let's finish with this, uh, the special team situation. Again, windy day. We saw in warmups that it was maybe going to be a challenging afternoon for the kickers. Uh, there were not a lot of uh, makes once they started going from some distance. Uh, the winds seemed to die down a little bit. Uh, they ended up not, you know, a, a, um, taking these guys uh, or putting these guys out there for long field goals. There was a moment where they could have sent someone out for a 46 yarder. They went for it on a fourth and five or six situation on, on offense instead. At the end of the day, we saw Ryan Barker as the only place kicker used in the first half. I believe he had a, the field goal. He had the extra point. By the end of the game, we saw other guys get involved. Uh, Sanders Haydak had a converted field goal. Uh, we saw uh, the, the transfer from Tulsa, Chase Meyer, uh, kick an extra point. So all three guys involved. But the, the takeaway for me here is that Ryan Barker is the leader as they close up shop in spring practice and, and get ready to carry that three-man competition into August. You look at how the, the rosters were set up and Team White had Tyler Duzanski, Riley Thompson and Ryan Riley Thompson and Ryan Barker, every, all the other specialists. And we know there's a lot on this roster, the way that Penn state runs that room. Uh, we're on the blue team. So I think that that's something that you can read into a little bit. Duzanski is the incumbent long snapper Thompson coming back for two more years at punter um, and putting Ryan Barker in that mix. I think on paper that 
you know, shows you a little bit um, of, of how that is shaking out. I know that Justin Lustig has said some good things uh, to you about what Ryan Barker has done um, and, and his kind of steadiness. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that competition, we know how valuable it can be. We And we know how quickly things can change. We just saw it a year ago uh, with Sanders to Haydak and Alex Falcons. And we know that when you want to compete at the highest level of college football, you can't lose games on the margins. You can't leave points on the board uh, like we've seen Penn State do in the past. Um, that competition, I assume, is going to stretch into August. Uh, but I, I think you can feel... We, and we didn't see too much today, obviously, but I think that Ryan Barker is, is a name to highlight there as we move forward. Yeah, you, you've got Barker coming in last year as a walk-on player. Uh, you've got Chase Meyer, who was Tulsa's starter last year. Very effective for them, but a lot to learn about how he can handle things from, from some distance. Um, and then you've got Sanders Sahedak, who was the top-ranked kicker overall in 24-7 Sports 2021 rankings. But to this point, he's only converted two field goals in his career. And you talked about leaving points on the board. He left six points on the board in the first half last year, the season opener against West Virginia, ultimately did not get another chance to kick a field goal uh, during the season as that job went to Alex Falcons, who was a one-and-done transfer situation, and now Sahedak trying to compete to win it all over again. Uh, Compelling stuff and something that they definitely want to have figured out and buttoned up by the time August uh, 31st rolls around. Daniel, we managed to go over an hour (laughs) breaking down a practice uh, here in April. So uh, we did it. We we got through the the (laughs) post-game podcast. I thought we could maybe get a half hour. Lucky us, we doubled that. We will be back on Monday. We'll take a a longer look at at what we kind of picked up off the television broadcast when we have a chance to do that. We'll have Mark Brennan join us because I know he's got some differing opinions on on some things from this matchup that he wants to share. He'll let us know about them. (laughs) Yes, he will. Is there anything that – oh, by the way, there's a ton of recruiting coverage right now uh, happening at lines 247com Tyler Calvaruso has already caught up with several recruits. Uh, you'll hear from Brian Doan on a bunch of recruits, and, and we'll get Tyler Calvaruso uh, up on the next podcast with us as well to break down the recruiting impact here. But, Daniel, before we move on with our evenings and, and, and get some sleep, is there anything you want to throw out on the table to make sure we don't forget to throw out on the table? No, I mean, I, I think that it was really fun to be back in there today. I'm looking forward to going back through the, the TV copy. I think the one one take that I'm kind of coming away with and, and workshopping is that I feel really good about the defense. Uh, mm. I, I don't think statistically it'll be as good as it was last year because that unit was pretty close to being historically great. Um, but I do like what Penn State has, the different pieces that it has. You know, we'll see what everything looks like come August. We know that a lot can change. Um, but you know, coming away from it, you know, I feel like, I don't know how I don't think I'm going that far out on a limb, but I don't think there will be a significant drop off from what we saw last year. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, been fun breaking it down with you. We'll, we'll pick up the pieces and do it a little bit more uh, again on Monday before we send you off for your European vacation and <laughs> well-earned vacation, might I add. But a uh, fun stuff. Thanks to everyone for listening or watching. This has been the Lions 24-7 podcast. He is Daniel Gallen. I'm Tyler Donahue. Catch all of our blue-white coverage over at lions247.com. Uh, we got two more episodes of this show coming your way next week. Until then, enjoy yourself. <laughs>